I want to present a theory of inquiry, which is something that I have been developing for some years now. This is a theory in the sense that it allows me to act better in some contexts. It is not a theory in the sense that I claim universality or superiority over any other model of theory. Much of this has already been written up, but I'm now, through this conference, trying to extend it, and that's the temporality bit in the, in the title, and I will point that out as I go. Very quickly, talking about where this has been written up, there is a book on design cybernetics that I have edited with Candy Hair that's coming out this summer, and I have a chapter on this work in there that I'm now trying to extend. Yeah, take your time taking a picture of this. <laughs> so, what is this for? I find this body of work helpful in the context of postgraduate teaching, especially PhD supervision. The purpose is to describe basic modes of inquiry with regards to relevant evaluation criteria and to guide PhD supervisors and students towards defensible theses. And also, I enjoy explaining more with less. The defensibility bit, I hope you don't misunderstand as the general gist of this. This helps, I believe, students to arrive at more defensible thesis in the context of design research. But I do not want to imply that we as a field in design cybernetics, design research, should generally take a defensive posture. Uh, we run up against different philosophies of evaluation, and I think in that context we should be bold, but this is not for all students, and some, for some students I think there is reason to play things safe. So what does it mean if we come from one uh, school of thought and we throw our students into evaluations within potentially other hostile schools of thought? Just to make this point, this is not about generally taking a defensive posture, but it's a possibility to do so where the need arises. So I am assembling a number of different models and theories in this. One is the epistemological triangle that was probably best developed by Heinz von Furster and Stuart Umpleby. There are different observer dispositions that locate observers relatively to the boundaries of the systems they are engaged with. I'm tying this in. In design research, there is a, I think, very helpful distinction between three different kinds of design research, research for design, research through design, and research about design. I have mapped these 10 years ago on those observer dispositions in a thesis that was examined by Wolfgang Jonas, who has then taken this further in a series of articles in which he has added a fourth dimension to this, research as design, and they can all be accounted for within this theory. I'm tying this together with a model by Robert Rosen called the modeling relation, and um, then I will relate this to design conversation as described specifically by Reynolds Glenville, and the new temporality element that I want to now see if I can tie in is Glenville's theory of objects and what that does as a formalism operating in and with time. So let's start by looking at some challenges of the design PhD. There are many, I'm just going through some. Many supervisors are practitioners, not academics, which means that they haven't received the kind of training that they are supposed to deliver. That is changing as more design academics with PhDs are entering into supervisory relationships, but this is still an issue. The second one I would call our originality complex. In architecture and design schools, we are compulsive innovators. When you go into an undergraduate design studio, professors expect their students not only to arrive at new things, but to also arrive at new things along new avenues and methods. And sometimes this spills over to PhD levels where we are much less prepared to walk on tested roads as maybe in the natural science. People might be prepared to rely on established methods. We constantly keep inventing new wheels 
to arrive at new findings in architecture and design PhD programs. Design is characterized by circularity, subjectivity, and spontaneity, and these are three dimensions along which design deviates from natural science and empirical science. Empirical science is all about predictability and linearity and objectivity, but in cybernetics, design finds a very good partner here because cybernetics is squarely centered on these ideas. There is a difference between looking from the outside and the perspective of operating on the inside. I will hopefully be able to explain that a little bit more later in the presentation, but the idea here is that a designer is engaged within an activity of inquiry, whereas evaluation usually has to respond to criteria that are outside in a scientific research context and in empiricist modes of examination. And then there's a general compatibility problem between scientific research and design that somehow students have to bring together in a design PhD. And there's a whole lot of mutually exclusive <coughs> modes of thinking that are very difficult to reconcile. And I remember doing my design PhD, I had a very vivid image in my mind of having to mix oil and water in a glass because doing justice to designing while at the same time being able to defend that work vis-a-vis -vis criteria of natural science is extremely difficult and the oil and the water they naturally don't want to mix. And the question is, if mixing doesn't work, what else might work? And this theory is a response to that question. What else is there than just blending of substances that don't want to come together? So the relationship between science and design has been the subject of much debate. Herbert Simon suggested that design should become properly scientific, and where it wasn't, it was deficient. A little bit later, Christopher Jones suggested that design is in the intersection between science, the arts, and mathematics. Bruce Archer then suggests in 1979 that design is a discipline in its own right, separate from the sciences and the humanities, and eventually Ranulph Glanville turns the initial image proposed by Simon around, and he says that rather than design being a particular discipline within the broader scientific endeavor, it's the other way around, and scientific research is a particularly constrained activity within the more general activity of human designing which, of course, has certain implications in terms of power relationships on university campuses and doesn't always go down well. But this is the, pers <laughs> that's the, the perspective that I'm taking. So to begin this exploration, I want to start with three elements. The designer over there, something that's being designed, and a way of talking about it. Let's call that design theory. Or, more simply... Let's talk about describers, the described, and description. This triangle shows up in several places, and this has been described by Stuart. There's some references about how uh, Stuart has built upon a discussion proposed by Heinz von Thurster in 1971 about how these relate. Uh, this also maps on the three worlds described by Karl Popper and some other models. So this is a separation of things that we normally don't find separated in the world, but this separation makes uh, for a very good model to talk about what I want to talk about. So one thing that Heinz and Stewart have identified here, that the three edges in this triangle, for example, map onto different agendas of linguistics, pragmatics, uh, what does language do in the world, syntax, how does a description map on what we observe in the world, and semantics, what does a description mean to us. This also maps onto different science philosophical traditions, if you will. Pragmatism, as it is prevailing in North America, empiricism, as it dominates in the UK, or idealism that uh, is most commonly encountered in continental Europe, as Stuart points out. This by itself is already a very good map of the intellectual environment, to me, moving between different contexts. But we can move on from this and map this on a distinction between three different modes of design research that were proposed by Christopher Freiling. Research about design, 
which is an empiricist approach to what designers are doing, research through design, which is a pragmatic action in the world, and research through design, where we ask what does a particular creative experience mean to us, what's the significance of it. And as I said, Wolfgang Jonas has extended this with a fourth dimension that he refers to as research as design, which is basically our perspective right now, looking at this entire triangle, potentially using it to navigate these three worlds. And these can be mapped onto Glenville's observer dispositions, as I call them, where the observer is inside, looking in, observer is outside, looking in, observer is inside, looking out, observer is outside, looking out. And I would argue that these three edges of the triangle prefer certain modes of evaluation. Yeah? Empiricist inquiry is evaluated in terms of predictability. Uh, does a description allow us to predict something described? Uh, along the pragmatist edge, the criterion is utility. True is what works. And uh, along the idealist edge, the criterion is meaningfulness. Is there a point to it? And in my experience, when you have a new PhD student and, and, and you ask them, how do you think what you are doing should be evaluated? That's a very difficult question to answer. And if you give them this menu and you say, should it be evaluated in terms of its ability to predict, or its utility, or its meaningfulness, then the typical answer is all of them. And that's the problem. That's the, the blending and the mixing. And I'm trying to see what we can do to deal with them in separate ways. Okay, so in order to explore this, let's start by looking at the empiricist relationship in here, which I think is probably the worst case that can happen. So let's look at that. And uh, in order to do that, we assume the perspective of the describer like this. And now the result is that we only have two elements left, a description and something described. And as a naming convention... <laughs> This is basically territory and map. Very simple. But we can also refer to them as an N and an F, as in a natural system and a formal system. And these stand in a relationship. And the question is, what is the nature of the relationship between a territory and a map? If you think of, let's say, a census within a, a state, then the statistical description of the population depends on what is going on in the population, but then the governance of the population might in turn be dependent on the census data. In short, they are interrelated in a circularly causal fashion, like this. So we have a natural system and a formal system, and moving between them could be described as an encoding and a decoding. Now, how does a natural system qualify to enter into this relationship in an empirical context? There has to be a causal relationship. Something has to have an effect on something else so that it can be looked at in terms of dependent and independent variables. And a formal system qualifies for this relationship by allowing us to draw inferences so that we can make predictions about instances of N that have not yet been observed. And now we have constructed out of the epistemological triangle another model which is Boson's modeling relation. I'm changing a few words. I'm now calling these modeling and predicting and I'm putting the letter pi down here which denotes the locus observandi. This means the observer is removed from the system and pretends to not be present. Okay, so let's take a look at the upper arrow where we are predicting. That is where a piece of work can become very robust and very defensible if it shows, if it affords prediction. Then it's very difficult to poke a hole into a PhD thesis once the formal system allows us to reliably in some way predict what's going on in the natural system. But this idea of repeatability and predictability doesn't really apply to the activity of designing, which is all about surprise and spontaneity. So let's move this 
away. I'll bring it back later again and let's start again from our triangle and see what else we can find in here. Let's look at the pragmatist edge and ignore description for the moment. Let's just look at describers or observers interacting, operating in the world. So we push description to the background. Again, we are ending up with two elements, the described and the describer. And let's call these O for other and S for self. This is an encounter between a self and an other. And you notice that the letter pi now is not outside of the diagram. It is at S because the observer is the self. And again, the question is, what's the relationship between the two? And clearly, it's a circular relationship. We act on the world and we perceive what happens. The other qualifies for entry into this relationship by exhibiting pattern. There has to be a difference that makes a difference. And then self reflects upon that and enters into a relationship characterized by acting and understanding. And what I have done now is I've given a description of Reynolds Glanville's account of design conversation using the form of Rosen's modeling relation. But this is with pi located at S no longer an objectivist empiricist model. This is a design inquiry model. And now comes the temporality bit that I intend to add on to this. Ranulf has developed a theory of objects. And that deals with the fact that the observer entering into a relationship with another has to do two things. The observer, you see there's a loop over here, and there's a loop over here. The observer observes both the other and the self. And it is difficult to model that formally because there are two operations going on. And Ranulf gave a tutorial on this in Bolton. There's a video on it on YouTube about his theory of objects where he talks specifically about the problem he faced when he was challenged to describe this relationship using formalism. And he said, I cannot really deal with formalism, therefore I have invented my own, which is that notation over there. And what is changing in there is S, which is time. P is the observer, E is the observed, and this is a formalism that moves one step at a time in time, and at one moment the observer observes self, and at the next moment the observer observes other, and thereby these things can be kept apart with a linear operator, and if you have multiple of these, they go together like a, a zipper, and in this way, by taking time into account, it is possible to model a relationship where there are two things going on at the same time in a formal system. And I want to see how I can tie this in here. So let's go back to the plot as it's already developed and bring back Rosen's modeling relation. Yeah, these are our two models, one with the observer outside, one with the observer inside. And because I want to do more with these models now, I want to introduce a slightly simplified notation. Okay? What you see on the right means the same that we have over here, but I'm taking out some visual detail so I can do more within the limited space of the screen. And now we can describe four different scenarios where instead of mixing and blending different forms of inquiry, we concatenate and nest these inquiries so that they become recognizable within themselves but don't really spill over into each other and in that form become potentially more defensible on separate terms. There is the possibility of doing a design PhD through design without any appeal to objective truth or predictability if the student is confident to be able to defend that if the exam committee is open-minded enough that is perfectly viable and hopefully we have much more of that establishing our discipline and its PhD research on its own terms. There's no problem with that straightforward where it can be defended. But if one wishes to play things safer, this whole relationship of a designer interacting with something in the world can to some extent 
be approached as an observable in the world, and we can put a box around it, treat it as a natural system, and then try to describe it. And that is research about design. Yeah, I can establish an observational lab, put a bunch of designers in, and make a video recording of what they do, and maybe I have a control group that gets the same brief, but no coffee, and then I compare. How, how creative are they? How productive are they? This is an example of nesting. And now I have a lot more work, admittedly, but I can in separate movements do justice to design while at the same time have some robustness in the face of conventional scientific scrutiny. So let's do that in another mode. Here's our design inquiry. And now we have a second one. The upper one produces what I call an enabling resource, which could be a new material, it could be a 3D modeling tool, it could be a set of data. There's one inquiry that produces something of use in another inquiry. That is a concatenation of two inquiries that can be described as research for design. Again, there's nothing empiricist or objective about it, but again, we can take that relationship also, put a box around it, and try to describe it in terms of scientific research. And then there's the research as design perspective that is never really becoming explicit in a thesis. That is where we strategize about how the thesis is put together and how we sample from those different modes. And at that level, it is always a design inquiry. Yeah, this is where research is designed. In summary, there's a notable level of consistency across cybernetic models and theories that allows their integration into larger assemblies. Empiricist, pragmatist, and idealist research approaches can be combined, preferably not by arbitrary blending, but by nesting and or concatenating distinguishable inquiries, commitment to predictability, utility, or meaningfulness as the primary evaluation criterion suggests the associated overall research approach. Yeah? Once you know that you want to defend this on grounds of predictability or utility, you know where in the triangle that dominant mode of the inquiry needs to be located. Objectives and approaches can be chosen with a strategic view towards defensibility within a given context, which may or may not be possible. Some universities are quite bad at letting their PhD students know what the criteria are by which examiners are invited to examine what they're doing. So students are playing a game without really knowing what the rules of the game are until the, the exam happens. Uh, there are some PhD programs where there's a regular feedback process, but that doesn't mean that the examiners are from the same crowd and there's that element of risk. Sometimes it is possible to influence the choice of examiners, but that can also go wrong and there's a choice here where that allows playing things safer by assuming worst case scenarios and wrapping designerly inquiry within a formally more defensible inquiry. Thesis built on suitable concatenations and nestings of suitable approaches can both do justice to designing and be defensible under scientific scrutiny. Thank you very much.